Hello, Monetization Nation. I'm Nathan Gwilliam, your host. Today, I'm talking with Ross Rich. Ross is a co-founder and CEO of Accord. Accord is a customer collaboration platform for B2B sales, onboarding, and success. Before founding Accord, Ross spent more than four years at Stripe, where he helped scale the sales team from three to 500. In today's episode, we're going to discuss seven tactics for B2B sales. We'll cover the following key takeaways. Number one, we should align our sales and marketing teams to give our customers a seamless and consistent experience. Number two, if we make it easier for a customer to get in touch with us, our chances of converting our leads increases. Number three, we should keep the same point of contact throughout the customer's journey. Number four, Everything we do should be done to give our customers a better experience. Number five, we should provide value to our customers before asking them for a sale. Number six, we should have fewer conversations with the right users. Number seven, customers are really passionate about brands who can help them solve their problems. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Ross. Yeah, appreciate you having me and excited to dig in today. So can you start off by sharing with us something that you are super passionate about? Super passionate about. I mean, all things uh, B2B sales and, and startup company building, but maybe something more on the personal side. Um, I'm an avid downhill skier. Spent the last um, winter up in Tahoe, California for seven months. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something I'm very passionate about outside of all the work stuff. So on today's show, we're going to talk about fresh B2B tactics in an outdated market. And I'm wondering if you can share with us one of the greatest home runs or successes that you've had in your career related to B2B sales. Yeah, that was probably, um, it's funny. The first thing I think about with that is like, it's definitely in figuring out B2B sales and that that's, uh, you know, a huge passion of mine and, and uh, where I got, you know, that uh, first big win in my career. But it reminds me of this quote of like, you know, no one sets out to be a B2B salesperson who, you know, is thinking in middle school and high school and university of like, I'm going to be in B2B sales and technology for my career. Um, I think falling into that at Stripe was probably the biggest, uh, biggest when I was the top rep there for pretty much my whole tenure. Um, it's part of kind of growing the, the sales side of the business. So yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. So tell us about the biggest failure you've had or mistake that you've made related to B2B sales. Yeah, I think I see a lot of people have, I won't name names, but I, I see a lot of people that have, um, sales processes in the B2B world that does not reflect how people actually want to buy. I think they're living in this outdated world where you know they think folks need to purchase from them for some reason and they're the only person in the market. You know, if you're not letting someone book a demo from a request demo button, they need to wait another day or two to hear back from an SDR and then be qualified before they can actually talk to a sales rep who actually understands their problem is going to have that productive conversation you'd be surprised about the, you know, really great brands um, out there who you can't even talk to within 24, 48 hours, someone who can help you buy the thing. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest mistakes is, you know, not really reflecting the, the modern buyer journey and the sales process today from a lot of companies out there. Let's start off by having you tell me about your journey, your journey with Accord and, and how you scaled that business. Yeah. Great question. So, um, I founded Accord just under two years ago. So I started with my brother, who's my co-founder, Ryan. And I had just spent about four and a half years at Stripe, scaling out their sales team. And he was at a couple startups before and then joined Google Cloud in the early days um, on the sales side. And we had both kind of you know, thought of a couple core problems that led us to leaving these jobs and starting Accord. Um, the first being just the challenge of driving um, consistent and repeatable customer journeys and experiences, you know, you'd look across your team and there'd be a couple amazing, you know, classic, like a couple amazing sales reps who are just like every buyer would love to work with, super collaborative, transparent, you know, really helping them guide them through this journey and being an amazing partner and consultant. And then I would say the average rep just, you know, I think they want to be a good salesperson but it feels like they're not really building that great relationship, aren't very collaborative. They're really trying to sell the thing. They're trying to do their job, which they think is, you know, to force their product on people. 
And I think that was the first thing that led us to starting Accord, which is creating the shared workspace, more collaborative, um, you know, repeatable sales process. So that was kind of the grain of the idea. We started the journey in, you know, we're not engineers. We're just, you know, we were sales guys. What are we going to do? We're not going to write lines of code. We're not going to design the product. We started with, you know, basically hundreds of conversations with fellow sales leaders, reps, CEOs, and even buyers about their kind of, you know, thoughts around what we were working on. And just unanimously, people thought, you know, there's a better way of doing this. There's a way to drive more consistency, predictability, and collaboration in sales. So that was the first part. Um, after we left our jobs, we joined an accelerator called Y Combinator, um, which really helped us kind of, you know, figure out how to actually build a company. Um, again, we had no experience building software, just working at high tech companies. And um, from there, it was, you know, hiring the first engineers, really putting the product together and working super closely with our first customers to, to build the thing. So, um, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty awesome experience. And today we're at 14 people have raised about seven million dollars of funding and, uh, you know, starting to really scale up the thing. Congratulations. That's a wonderful success story. Are you finding the buyers pretty receptive to coming and participating in this new workspace? That's a great question. And something that took us, you know, it was a big bet because we'd have to, you know, first build the thing, have sellers use it and share with their customers to validate. And that takes a long time to have, you know, professional salespeople and teams put out a piece of software and this new concept to their buyers that they work really hard to you know, first have the conversation with and really risk the deal on. I think unanimously what we've heard heard from our customers' customers, the buyer, is that they really appreciate, especially the transparency that this brings to the buyer's journey. Um, we've heard quotes from, you know, some of the favorite ones that come to mind, um, you know, like, thank you for rolling out the red carpet for us is one, you know, it really feels like you're doing this extra work for them. But it's helpful for the seller to do the deal because the buyer then takes this to their other, you know, internal stakeholders. On average, in B two B sales, there's about 14 of them internally on the buyer side. So you're kind of giving your buyer and champion the ability to frame the story and the deal in a way that you think is helpful, and it saves them from all the extra effort that they're going to do to sharing this with all their internal stakeholders. So yeah, I think I think unanimously, it's been um, super helpful for buyers to get their jobs done as well. I love it. So you're you're helping the person you're communicating with to sell it to the other internal stakeholders. Yeah, it's a tough job and they have a real job on top of that. So, yeah. Okay. So what are some of those fresh B2B tactics that we can use in this outdated market? Yeah, good question. Maybe I'll start at uh, at the top of the funnel in terms of, you know, more of the uh, marketing and positioning stuff. I think one of the most underrated exercises even when people think about sales is what's the message that you're telling people at every touch point before they even talk to the sales rep? Are you setting up your sales team for success with their conversations? If the story that you're telling through your brand, your content, your website is a totally different story. And this is something that we see all the time is this misalignment between sales and marketing. So you're really setting the expectations for that conversation in the wrong kind of way. So you might have a separate, you know, marketing team is targeting a separate market or segment or product and your sales team's coming in has to completely reframe um, either the problem or the product or what have you. So I think that's kind of collaboration between sales and marketing to set up for a successful conversation, obviously very, very important. I think something that is, um, you know, kind of undervalued um, in terms of like a very tactical tip. I think I mentioned this earlier, making it really easy for your customer to actually have a conversation with you if they want to. Something that I experienced, which made us change it on our site, is being able to book a demo directly from the request demo button on their site. It actually brings up an embedded calendar through something like HubSpot or Calendly. It was just such an incredible, like joyful experience as the potential buyer. I was free for the next 30 minutes. I booked the meeting and jumped on a demo pretty much right after I requested it. And you know, it was top of mind, the problem just like created such a better interaction instead of me putting in my email address, phone number, hearing back from the sales rep, maybe a few hours later, scheduling the call for later that week. Maybe it's not a priority anymore. Something else comes up. Um, I think that's a really great tactic to set up the experience from day one 
um, in a super positive way and, you know, not leave uh, some of those deals to, to competitors like we were talking about before. Yeah, I love that point. I, I've seen some statistics about uh, phone sales and response times, and I've, I've seen some data and I could be quoting this a little bit wrong, but basically if, if you respond within a minute to the lead versus if you respond within half an hour to the lead, you might have four times the chance of having a meaningful conversation with that person. So the, the lead that's hot at the moment they submit the lead is in many cases, not hot 30 minutes later. And they go on, they look at competitors, they get busy with other things. And so acting on it quickly, not only is the experience, not only is that the experience that the customer wants, but it greatly increases the chance of converting that lead. Totally. Yeah. I think it works better for both sides, which is exactly what, uh, you know, how I think about great, great B2B sales. Okay. Uh, what is your next B2B tactic? Next B2B tactic. I think um, another thing that I see kind of uh, structurally wrong that, uh, or at least in my opinion, um, that could be better is a lot of handoffs during the sales process in B2B. I think there's almost this wave of like hyper segmentation of roles. Um, that started in, you know, kind of the SDR role versus an AE. I actually think that makes a lot of sense. I think someone who's trying to start conversations, it's a very different job than actually selling someone. But I think with the world of sales and onboarding and success, I think a lot of times, especially if it's a, you know, a lighter weight sale, having the same point of contact throughout um, is incredibly helpful. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to have, you know, maybe technical sales help on the sales side, then maybe you have an onboarding specialist that they're going to partner with and customer success. But having that single point of context and contact, it's so frustrating when you, you know, you buy the thing or you're getting to the end of it and you get introduced to someone else and you have to spend two or three calls reiterating, you know, what you were talking about in the first place and what you're trying to solve with this product. And then you go to a customer success lead who probably has never had a conversation with your account executive or onboarding specialist. I think that's something that, uh, Again, when you look at, you kind of zoom out and you're maybe the CEO or, you know, head of revenue, you're like, oh, this makes sense. We can specialize on these roles. We can focus on more customers. But those interactions, I think, just um, really suffer and your customer suffers through that. And, you know, um, you'll probably see longer term and the lack of expansion, maybe, or higher churn rates in those experiences that you're creating and not setting your customers up for success long term. Okay. You've talked about the market being outdated. How is the market outdated? What has changed? Oh my God, what hasn't changed? Um, one of the biggest things I think that has happened is, you know, obviously the proliferation of technology and therefore the options in the market. Before it was like, okay, are you going to use Oracle or SAP? Now, just like the number of potential options for like very specific so software. Um, is just crazy. Like there's five to 10 different ones. You can't just say, Hey, you're going to get in touch with me this week and another competitor. And it's going to be a bake off. Like you said, at the beginning, you're going to do your research. There's going to be, you know, potentially dozens of options. And the one that's going to do best is going to be the one you talk to first, the one that has the best reviews, and it's going to be validated by the customer, not just from the sales process. So that to me is one of the biggest dynamics is the number of options that buyers have. And I guess to take that a step above is before sales teams were in the driver's seat a lot more and had a lot more leverage, I'd say that 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 shift has been like this huge transition and you're outdated if you're not thinking about the world through that lens. And again, this buyer journey, and you're thinking about it through the lens of, you know, we're one of the only teams that you're going to talk to. Um, that I think is like the core foundation of the outdated versus modern um, sales experience. Okay. You've talked about fresh tactics in B2B sales. So let's see, what's the opposite of fresh, like r rotten maybe? <laughs> what, are, what are some of the rotten tactics that we should avoid using in B2B sales? My pet peeve is asking someone for pricing on a demo. This happened the other day. I couldn't believe it. They said that they can't tell me the pricing until they get to their end of their demo. <laughs> Who's the demo for? It's it's not just to do the thing. It's like thinking about this world in like such a process, old school way. It's like, we're supposed to be building this relationship. You're supposed to be helping me solve this problem. You're not there just to regurgitate something. 
And that is a great example, again, of like the question you just asked, this like old world versus new world. You would never say that if you thought about it from, oh, there's 10 other options he could look at. Half of them probably have their pricing on the site. We don't. You know, how are you going to think about it from that lens versus I need to get through this thing first because I haven't pitched enough value to them. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good example, I think. Okay, so a lot of what you're suggesting comes down to creating a great customer experience, giving the the end user that experience that they're wanting from you, not what you're wanting to kind of cram down their throat instead. So what ideas do you have about how an organization can kind of shift their mindset to this focus on a, a customer experience instead of tr trying to implement the most manipulative sales process that they can? I think talking to buyers, people that either have purchased your thing or not, especially, um, is probably the most impactful thing that you can do. Um, I was talking to someone on my team about this earlier today and the power of things like Gong, like the recorder, if you've heard of like Gong and Chorus, where you can listen to customer calls directly, like hearing it directly from them is just such, it's just a human way to make change in your organization. Like hearing some consultant come in and say this, or us say this on the podcast, like how much does that really impact them um, deeply versus hearing it directly from a buyer on a one or lost deal and hearing this was my process. First, you know, I asked colleagues and they were this, you know, this stage of company or, you know, this role at a company. And then I went on the site, this is what I actually searched. And then you play that back and go through it yourself. The, that level of understanding, I don't think can exist without spending time directly with, um, your customers or prospective customers. So I think that's a really great place to start if people want to think about this. It's not following the frameworks. It's not, you know, reading books and all that kind of stuff. I think it has to do with really feeling the experience that your customer wants. Yeah, that, that would probably be, I think, my number one piece of advice that people want to kind of, you know, switch to this, this way of doing business. Okay, so it feels like we need to shift from being perceived as a vendor or being a vendor to becoming a partner with these companies we're working with. Do you, do you agree with that statement? <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you've read our website. <laughs> How do we make that shift from, from vendor to partner? Yeah. I think it's, it's really in kind of everything that we're talking about today, which is how can, if you were a buyer of your company and you had this problem, how would you go about evaluating, validating, onboarding, and being successful versus trying to maximize that one-time purchase um, and getting them in the door? I think another helpful way of thinking about this is kind of shifting from that classic, you know, kind of like sales revenue mindset to more of a like holistic product experience and, you know, how I think product designers think about, um, you know, kind of taking the frameworks of other parts of the organization and including it in sales. It's not that sales is wrong. It's about kind of like melding together different best practices and frameworks. And again, I think UX designers and product designers think about this already in all parts of their job. And I think I've learned a lot from, you know, kind of building Accord the software and, and think, I love the way that they think about um, the customer journey, the buyer journey the whole time, right? They think about every little interaction. What are they going to think about these words that we're using in this? And I don't think we think about that in sales, right? We don't get down to that level of detail and really put ourselves in their shoes. So, All right, let's shift to marketing for a little bit, marketing in a B2B environment. If we're wanting to do content marketing in B2B sales, what type of, of content is, the, is best to create? Something with a unique point of view. I think something that's lacking a lot in the B2B world versus the B2C world is an opinion. I think everyone is afraid to have it. But that's the only thing that captures attention. Like, pick a side, like have an opinion on something. It's not just, you know, we're the fastest thing and the best. It's like, what makes you unique versus everything else in the market? I think that's something that I see some of the best brands do and why they break through the noise of all of this mark of all of the, you know, kind of like paid ads and stuff is they have a very clear opinion. They have a brand that sticks out and they just repeat and repeat and repeat that. It's not about, you need a new fresh idea every week. I think it's, you need at the core, a 
unique point of view. And I think a great example of this and a lot of people use is Salesforce, you know, forever ago was like the anti-software. Software used to be the big install. They were on the cloud. The anti, you know, we're against this. This is what's frustrating to you and everyone can understand it. And this is what we're doing now. And I think so many people don't, you know, either go against something or very for something. They are just, you know, the best so-and-so. Um, so that's, I think, the, what makes the best contact content is something that's opinionated and unique. Okay, so a lot of people in the B2C world have been having, a lot of marketers have been having success providing value first. Instead of trying to go for the sale, you know, at first contact, they fo they're focusing on providing value first and building a relationship and, and, um, and then, you know, the sale coming as a, as a further step in the process. How have you seen that strategy applied effectively in the B2B space? How do you provide B2B value first? Yeah, I think a lot of people have tried this and you see a lot of eBooks and you see a lot of templates and, you know, kind of some of the content strategy around providing best practices or, you know, blog posts or, or podcasts. And I, to me, it feels like more of, an afterthought in a lot of ways and like kind of a check mark than a core strategy. So I think there, you know, in what comes up in my mind is something like you can have a blog piece and it's like optimized for SEO and it's a way for people to find you. And it's kind of like very fluff material. Maybe a third party content writer wrote it and someone gave them an outline versus something that was like really written by an expert in the space that has spent hours thinking about it. Or what I think the best is, is like real kind of like templates and frameworks that people can take. So if you're the expert for us, for example, if we're the expert in B2B sales, let's share some like sales email examples or, you know, like really tactical guides or frameworks. And I think it's something that we can work on, but I think that would be the big difference um, that I'm seeing is like, you're saying you're providing value and you're talking about the things, but it's not really something that someone's gonna take and be like, wow, this changed the way I did something. Yeah, where I think, in, like you're right, in the B2C world, you see a lot of that because the funnel's so wide. Like, I think a lot of the top of the market activities you can do in the B2C world is a bit easier to fund, but you kind of need to take that bet in the B2B world if that's going to be part of your strategy. It doesn't need to be, but if you are going to do that, I think it needs to be, you need to spend a bit more time on that to, to break through. One of our listeners, if some of our listeners are, are struggling with their B2B sales. What's some advice that you would have for them of, of what they should be focusing on to turn that around? One thing that I consistently see from the top reps and companies is they have fewer conversations with the right users, which is why it's sometimes counterintuitive to go back to like your positioning. Who is your target market? What exactly is the problem you're solving for them? And how do you do that? And really spending your time with the people that are, even if you're, they're not buying your product, but are passionate about the problem and the space, that's a great place to invest time and in really deeply understanding and driving that understanding. So you're talking to the right people. I think you can grow sales teams and get more top of funnel leads and be having a lot of conversations that aren't very efficient, very long sales processes, low average contract value because they're not super passionate about it, get fewer of the right people to start. And I love this you know, quote from Impossible to Inevitable, a great B2B sales book is like, if you can get one, you can get two. If you can get two, you can get five. You can five to 10. Find those core people that are very passionate about your problem and the solution and the way you're solving it and go from there. I think a lot of people try to scale too fast. They think about growing, growing, growing. And the way that they solve it is more. It needs to be less, but like more focused on exactly what you're trying to do and the right customers. So sometimes hard to do, especially if you've already started that scaling process, but that would be my advice. Okay. So some of the favorite things for our listeners on the show are stories. And uh, if you want to say something that's going to be remembered by our audience, stories is one of the most effective ways to do that. Are there any great stories that you could share with our audience about B2B sales, either good or bad? Yeah. Hopefully I've shared a couple stories that are memorable um, so far, but, so, but one that stands out to me is, was my first like real big deal. Um, I'll keep this one short because I could probably, you know, spend an hour or two talking about it. But I remember I was I was promoted from kind of the SMB startup team to the real like, you know, upper mid market enterprise sales team. And I was like, I want to be the top rep on this team, you know, in my first year on it. And I did a ton of outbound. 
found this one account who wanted to, you know, we, I was in SF at the time they were in New York and it was the COO and the CFO. So like real decision makers got back right away from this outbound message. Hey, we're actually evaluating this problem and vendors right now. We're going to make a decision in the next month. The sales process is typically like, you know, six months to a year. This is a real one flying out to New York the next day. You know, oh man, there was like no seats left on this plane. I remember sitting like middle seat on this like, you know, five plus hour flight. I was like, this is the worst thing ever. Like terrible time of the day, you know, get out there, you know, invited to this executive meeting, bring one of the top, you know, folks from New York on our team there. And the CEO comes in probably, it's an hour long meeting. The CEO comes in probably 10 minutes late. We're kind of, you know, shooting the shit, trying to keep the conversation going, but they're pretty like down to business guys. And he comes in, he's like half on his phone answering emails and he's like, puts his feet up on the table and he's like, wait, how long is this meeting again? <laughs> it's like, they're waiting for you. And yeah, it's the next 50 minutes we have scheduled with this team. And he's like, oh man, I got a busy afternoon. Like, think we can keep it to 20? Like, dude, I just flew here. Like this whole thing I was super excited about. I'm like, is this even going to be a deal? Like what is going on? And I do the, you know, the whole like song and dance. Hey, that's why we're here. Blah, blah. He's barely paying attention. And I remember we get to the point on the slides where I took screenshots of their site and was kind of like doing a bit of a teardown to say how we could help, you know, fix these problems. And I remember like, boom, had everyone in the room's attention, the, you know, really focused again on solving their problems, getting in their mindset. This is the thing that they think about all the time. It's their site. These are the things that they're doing wrong that we can help with. And I feel like from then on, I started almost every meeting with this is what I can share with you, kind of going back to the adding value immediately, very tactically. This is something that I know that you guys are working on that I can help with. And that's going to drive this value. And that's like the best way to start any conversation. So that's something that I always go back to is, you know, whether it's, you know, especially executives, how do you make sure to get their attention? And it's always from doing the work, you know, whether it's just researching online, what's the new initiative? Do you have some perspective on it and engaging that way? Um, so that's kind of how I, how I try to, to approach deals moving forward. So I love that. You personalized it to them and you started with a big problem they were facing, right? People are really passionate about people who can help them solve their problems. Thank you so much, Ross, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. To learn more about or connect with Ross, you can find him on LinkedIn or check out his website at inaccord.com. And there's links to each of these sites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. You can also get a free copy of my ebook about passion marketing and learn how you can become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. You can also subscribe for free to Monetization Nation on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group, and on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode, and I wish you success in your B2B sales. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.